Hi, best friends. I'm Tabby. And I'm Caitlin. And today I will be teaching Tabby about the Russian mafia, also known as the Bratva, which translates to brotherhood. Um, uh, I love brotherhoods. Isn't I'm cute? so into that. Yes. It's like, that's so cute. Low key. They're cute. <laughs> like, I love that for you guys. Um, I do want to preface this by saying, if you thought you were going to mess up pronunciations about the Italian mafia, I'm going to absolutely butcher these Russian. Yeah, I am seeing some words that I ain't never seen before. (laughs) Yeah, so bear with me. I obviously, um, well, I shouldn't say obviously because you don't know me, but I don't speak Russian for those of you listening. Um, She's actually a sleeper spy. (laughs) Yeah. Ooh, wouldn't you like to know if I'm secretly Mm -hmm. pretending not to know Russian? The only one I know is the first one, Pekon. That's all I I know. I was going to say that wrong. So thank you. Anyways. We're just going to talk a little bit about the Bratva. It's something that I think in American culture, people tend to be less familiar with than the Italian mafia. Um, So hopefully we're all going to learn something new today. I know I did. To start off, something unique about the Bratva is that there's not a clearly defined like top down hierarchy. Like there is a hierarchy, but it's not the same as the Italian mafia where you have like the ultimate like top dog. Um, In the Bratva, there are no, like no one's irreplaceable. It makes it significantly harder for the organization to be dismantled because everyone's replaceable. If if you murder some higher ups in the Bratva, it's like they're going to be okay. That does make sense, though, and we'll talk about it more um, for The Darkest Temptation, but that's essentially what happened. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So we're going to start off with the hierarchy and roles that do exist, um, starting with the Pecan, which is um, also known as Boss Kresniotets, and I can't remember what that translates to, Vor, which translates to Thief, Papa, self-explanatory, Avtoritet, which is authority. So the Pecon is technically the top of the hierarchy, but again, it's not quite, it doesn't carry the same weight as like an Italian mafia don. They are in control though. They are the boss. And so they are the ones controlling everyone through intermediaries called a brigadier. And we'll come back to brigadiers. So I've heard that one before. Yeah. So next we're going to talk about like the security group, which is called, um, as a whole, it's called the two spies, but it's split into two subgroups, hence the two spies. So uh, the two spies role is that they monitor brigadiers to ensure loyalty <laughs> to the current PACON and to make sure that none of them are becoming too powerful. So it's split into the Soviet NIC, which is the quote unquote support group and the Abshak, which is the security group. Their role is literally just to make sure that everyone's doing what they're supposed to do. So they're probably the ones who are like out, like controlling other groups and they want to make sure they're not like trying to overthrow or like. Yeah, I think that is their role. Basically, they're just making sure that everyone, whoever is truly um, the boss at the time, they're making sure they're staying loyal to that. Gotcha. Um, now, I'm not saying that there haven't been situations where they've somehow, like, overthrown that current boss anyway. Like, I don't know. But basically, this is just, like, the boss's security team. The next role that we're going to talk about, and I'm going to butcher the heck out of this, the Durs Hotel Abshaka is the bookkeeper and so that's the person who goes around and collects money from all of the brigadiers and then uses that money to then bribe the government or whoever to benefit the organization so the person in this role can be the boss themselves or kind of like delegated to someone like the consigliere it could be another brigadier doing this role basically someone's just assigned to it but What a brigadier is, and they're also sometimes known as avtoritet, which is uh, authority. Um, They're similar to capos. Mm -hmm. And so capos in the Italian mafia, if you remember, are like the little captains of the soldiers. And so 
A brigadier will assign jobs to boyeviks, which translates to warriors, and runs a crew called a brigade, um, or similarly, a capo regime. Mm -hmm. So brigades are made up to five to six Patsanov or Brodiog. And we're going to talk about what those mean as well. (laughs) So, okay, if you remember, boyeviks is a general word. It means warriors, so like soldiers in the Italian mafia. Um, But they're also called bratok which means brother, hence like Bratva brotherhood. So they can be either a Patsan, which is the Patsanov. I'm assuming that's just the plural. Um, and then Brodiaga or the plural is Brodiag that I talked about recently. So that's who makes up these brigades. But they carry out like different roles depending on like what they're... Kind of like, like the whatever. footwork... Yeah, so the the brigadier's in charge of, like, assigning these roles, but then Mm -hmm. the Patsanov or the Brodiag carry out different roles based on whatever their specific responsibilities are. Yeah. I'm not super sure, like, what the differences are, but it got a little bit confusing. But all we really need to know is they make up the brigade. They are the soldiers. They are the muscle. So, lastly, a... (laughs) This word is hard, too. A shestiorca is known as an associate to the organization. They're also called the six. So these are similar to, in the Italian mafia, what they just call an associate, I believe. And so mm-hmm. they're like the lowest ranking, basically just errand boys for the mafia, who their goal ultimately is to actually become, you know, like an inducted member. Mm-hmm. But at this point, They're at the bottom of the totem pole. The origins of the word, I thought this was kind of fun. Shestorka comes from the lowest rank of a 36 playing card deck, which were sixes. And so that's why they call it. I think it's cool that like you don't necessarily like you can be anybody to like kind of get started in it. Because like with the Italian mafia, if you wanted to be like an actual member, you had to come from an Italian background. Yeah. Yeah. But with this, I feel like it's probably a bigger organization because you can induct anybody. True. Good for them. More inclusive. Now we're going to talk about what the title Vor means. So again, Vor translates to thief. The plural in Russian is Vori. So that is an honorary title that would be analogous to calling someone a made man in the Italian mafia. So to become a Vor... A PECON or another high-ranking member must bestow that title upon you. And to become a VOR officially, you must accept the code of the VOR visa cone, which translates to thief in law. And so now we're going to talk about the history and how that came to be. So originally, back during Russia's imperial period, which began in the 1720s, there were these thieves that went around basically like Robin Hood. So I feel like this is the same all over the world. But in the 1700s, the majority of the population were fucking peasants who had nothing. So these thieves would go around stealing from rich people and government entities and then divide the profits amongst the general population. They were working for the people. Yeah. Uh, and so because, again, the, vo- the word vor means thief, then what became known as the Varovsky Mur, which translates to Thieves' World, formed. And so these thieves would form groups and make their own code of conduct that basically, again, similarly to the Italian mafia, it it was based on strict loyalty to the group and a disdain for authority figures and the government. Okay. Then, (laughs) in the early 1900s, Joseph Stalin, he was like, hey, y'all. He was a vor. Really? Yeah. So Joseph Stalin, he formed what was called the Red Battle Squads. He also formed a small group made of 10 people that was called the Bolshevik Expropriators Club, um, also known as the group or outfit. And so these 10 people, which included three women, I thought that was interesting. Uh, How inclusive. (laughs) Yeah. Not to applaud Joseph Stalin for anything, but that's... Yeah, like, he's a terrible man, but... Yeah, but, like, including women... That's cool. That's kind of badass. Um, But what they would do is they would procure arms and facilitate prison escapes, rob banks, and execute who they 
deemed traitors. Um, basically, anyone who uh, sided with the government, which is hilarious because then because he was the government. Well, not at this point, but oh, so, okay. So this from, was before. This was before because between 1917 to 1997 is the Soviet era. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, I forgot you said we were. That was yeah, early 1900s. He was like forming his little groups he was you know gaining power and support but then of course he became a dictator and during his reign millions of people were sent to gulags which are basically concentration camps um and so whenever these people were sent there if there were powerful criminals in these labor camps they were working them their ways up within that camp and forming their own little organizations of criminals. So I wonder what went so wrong that Stalin was like, I am going to become the government now. I think that he was just like, I can do it better. Which because- makes sense because that's like kind of how it was in, in the book. Like I said, we'll talk about it in the book too. Like they're trying to infiltrate mm-hmm. the government. Because so. they don't trust the government, but they trust themselves. And so Stalin put himself in that role. I but he fucked it up. He happened. fumbled so oh, hard. He fumbled the bag, dude. But um, yeah, so in these gulags, Vori are forming their own groups. Um, in this era, during the Soviet area, is when the tattoos um, began mm-hmm. as well. They began to get complicated tattoos to symbolize their status, and they're still used today. Which we're Like the stars? Talk. Yes. Okay. Um, so that began in the gulags. Um, Okay, so after Hitler invaded the Soviet Union, Stalin got nervous. And so he was like, okay, I'm going to recruit prisoners to join the army because we need more manpower. So he started offering them freedom if they fought for the army. Of course, this betrays the code of the Vorovsky Mur because they're supposed to oppose the government. And if anyone did agree to join the army, in exchange for their freedom, they were referred to by the loyal Vori as Suka, which translates to bitch. <laughs> so that's still a huge part of history because this led to, from 1945 to 1953, there were wars in the prison called the Suki Wars. So literally the bitch wars oh. from 1945 to 1953. And the prison officials were like encouraging it because they were like, well, there'll be less prisoners in the prison if they take each other out. Also, I think it's hilarious that Suki means bitch. Yes. <laughs> I'm thinking of all the people named Suki. Yeah, embarrassing. I love that, the bitch wars. Okay. Amazing. So flash forward a little bit to the 1970s and 80s. That's when Russian organized crime kind yeah. of came to the U.S. Because um, a bunch of immigration policies were expanded. Uh, lots of people came over. So <laughs> in 1992 to 2000, following the collapse of the USSR, Basically, these groups of Vori began to just take over the economy because it was like early stage capitalism at this point. They had all of the power. And so they were like, we are going to muscle our ways in and just own everything because yeah. we're not like they had the structure they, at this point. Yeah. Um, Lots of businesses and natural resources that the state had owned for decades became privatized. And so they were just buying it up. And then also any businesses that were owned by just like citizens, they began to make payments to the Vori for For, what's called Kresha or protection. protection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Something that also developed at that time was red Kresha, which is um, Kresha provided by corrupt police. You know, I just realized. What? Grisha sounds like Grisha. I was thinking and, like I that's this. what they are in the book is that they were yeah. like the protection to. I think she that is what she was doing. That is so funny. So in early 1993, it was estimated there were over 5,000 organized crime groups operating in Russia with an estimated 100,000 members. But officials do estimate that only about 300 of those groups would truly like um, be identified as like what the Bratva are. Yeah. Um, a lot of those organized crime groups were like either smaller scale or they didn't really have like a hierarchy like the Bratva did. Now, kind of from the early 2000s to the present, 
Russian mafia groups are extremely widespread. In 2009, they reached over 50 countries, so it's probably even higher now. Um, I thought this was interesting. So the Russian mafia has a really big stronghold in Atlanta, and I had no clue. But um, members are distinguished by their tattoos. So, I mean, you could just be walking down the streets of Atlanta and maybe recognize a Russian mafia member. Um, Also, they have a really strong presence in the French Riviera region and Spain. Which See, I, I think it's really cool, like, how big of a difference it is between the mafia and this, because, like, the mafia, I feel like, have kind of scaled back and, mm-hmm. like, keep way on the DL. Like, they've kind of put their yeah. holdings into, like, actual legit businesses. Um, and, like, the BRAP is doing that, too, but, like, it's obviously such a big, like, large-scale operation at this point. Like, they're not doing anything to, like hide it so like they must be pretty deeply immersed into like the government because it is interesting because it and we'll talk about this with stereotypes too but it seems like the brat are a lot more in your face than the italian mafia but i did also want to talk about like other mafia in russia because this is different than the true bratva Mm -hmm. There are also ethnic mafia groups in Russia, mostly from the Caucasus, Ukraine, and Armenia. A lot of them kind of follow the exact structure that the Bratva have, but tend to be a little more ruthless um, than the Bratva proper. However, some, (laughs) if you've heard of the Chechen mafia, um, they are, they're worse. They are fucking brutal. And so the Chechen Mafia was founded in the 1980s by Nikolai Soleimanov. They became the dominant crime group in Moscow and remain. So Chechens, in general, they kind of do their own thing. So they use the tribal structure of the tape, T-E-I-P, tape, tape, as well as the concept of an abrek, which is the outlaw hero. So I'm not sure exactly what that means, but basically the point is they're a lot more vicious and wild. They'd be wild. So Sophie Lark's series that I was telling you about, the Mm -hmm. um, one where they talk, like uh, the Kingmaker series, they actually talk about like all these other types of like mob and mafia groups. So they like mention all these. It's very interesting, the differences between them. It is because they're like geographically, like they're all right next to each other, but they're Mm -hmm. not the same. Pretty wild. The next interesting thing is that there's actually a language, oh, I guess it's a dialect really, uh, called Fenya, which is a Russian cant language used among criminals. So this developed by the Vori in prison. Um, so in in modern Russian language, they call it Blatnoi language because Blatnoi means uh, professional criminal. It's also widely used in thieves songs, which is like, you know, little like, oh. like chanties basically um so yeah fenya is a specific dialect that they would use to communicate so that like citizens wouldn't know what they were saying um interesting yeah i feel like most groups do that so that like oh yeah they can kind of communicate because that makes me think of like back during slavery like slaves would have like their own form of communication Mm -hmm. as well so that like the masters didn't know like what they were saying to each other or they'd sing it through song Mm -hmm. yeah it is kind of because it also like when it developed they were prisoners and and gulags so yeah the next thing we're going to talk about is tattoos which (sighs) i freaking love so mainly we're going to focus on the ones that are um because there are lots of prison tattoos in russian culture but we're going to focus on the ones that are mostly associated with the bratva so stars indicate authority it's kind of like either on their shoulders or their knees, because if it's on their knees, it's kind of like um, resand, but it's like, I kneel to no one, uh, you know, and he's got like, that. kingdom on his knees. So strong. Yes. And then the stars are eight pointed as well. Mm-hmm. Um, the cat tattoo is also just a traditional sign of a thief. Interestingly, um, some of them during the Soviet era would get portraits of Lenin and or Stalin on their chest Mm. because they thought that like they wouldn't get killed by a firing squad because they would refuse to shoot their leaders but they just shot him in the back of the head instead so 
And then they can also get an Orthodox church that indicates that they're a thief. It's usually on the chest. And that's what Christian had. Yes. The number of cupolas, which is like the little spiky things, indicates their number of convictions. Steeples? Yeah. I'm assuming that's the same thing. And then also the traditional thieves cross, which is tattooed on the chest, can mean similarly like to the Orthodox church that they are a thief. If they get medals on their shoulder, which is kind of like it looks like um, part of a soldier's uniform, then especially if it's done in the pre-Soviet style, that indicates that they have a contempt for authority and also a, a higher rank in the organization. And then if they get an eagle, then it traditionally indicates like a senior authority figure. They also do get finger tattoos. So there's a winged arrow, meaning that they're a traveling thief. And then a crown can indicate a crime boss or pig con. And then there's a lot of forced tattoos in Russian prisons as well. And one of my favorites is <laughs> it's I am a bitch. And But they're, you know, like to mark people as informants, um, betrayers, traitors. And then a lot of them mark them as homosexuals which is pretty fucked up yeah they are not big fans of of the lgbtq community (laughs) they are not allies so yeah now we're gonna talk about like in media and like stereotypes that kind of thing so this is a by the way all of that information is like from wikipedia Mm. this next quote is from tvtropes.org and so This says, Russian mobsters engage in all the same activities as Italian mobsters, but are typically depicted as much more openly ruthless, sadistic, brutal, and vicious. In other words, totally lacking the veneer of class and sophistication that many depictions of the Italian mafia have built up around the organization. The thinking is that because they had to operate in the Soviet Union and the new Russia, they are by definition stronger than your average mobster. You know, I might have to agree with that (laughs) because based off of what is happening in these prisons and gulags. um, Yeah. Sounds pretty brutal. No, that's fair. And you think about like the bitch wars and they were literally each other. Um, I mean, they have turf wars and like the mafia though. So I don't like I'm not I don't think one's worse than the other, but They do definitely sound different. (laughs) They both are scary, uh, for sure. But I think, like, again, and it comes back to, like, how structured the Italian mafia is. They have, like, a way of doing things where it seems like in the Bratva, it's a little more, like, have it your way. Do whatever you want. The next is a quote from, this is a show called Boomtown, which is a crime drama on NBC in the early 2000s. So a character named Vadim Solonik says, A fellow prisoner once told me he will kill my family, cut out my tongue, eyes, burn off my skin with acid, and shut down my business. Well, he did kill my family, but I still have my eyes, tongue, skin. Most important, I'm still in business, because I understood the man, so I was ready. See, we Russians don't make threats, only promises. And I was like, Wow! (laughs) Again, Um, I can't believe that (laughs) yes and so again that fits in with the stereotype of like they are scary they're scarier than your average average mobster russian prison sounds real scary Mm -hmm. (laughs) do you think most like it sounds like everybody in russia goes to prison at least once (laughs) i mean it's probably a lot easier to be sent to prison in russia sounds a little terrifying yeah it's not for me dog (laughs) it ain't for me (laughs) The final stereotype we're going to talk about is, like, their physical appearance. So, especially with tracksuits, the black Adidas tracksuits. Okay. So, the reason why this, like, happened is back in the Soviet era, Adidas-branded wear was a symbol of nonconformism because the Soviet elites did not approve of it. And, again, they were anti-government, anti-authority. A popular saying went, the one who wears Adidas will sell the motherland tomorrow. And apparently in Russian, it rhymes. So it's a lot more like cutesy. Hmm. So that's where it originated. And that's why they still wear them today is just kind of tradition and a symbol of nonconformism. But it is funny because they'll wear like a tracksuit and then they'll wear like dress shoes, which is hilarious to me. 
Um, Typically, they also will wear sunglasses and caps on their head. And then another thing that's kind of uh, interesting is in pictures, you'll oftentimes see them squatting. And the reason is that it was not considered to be acceptable for well-respected criminals to sit on the ground. So they would squat instead. Interesting. Yeah, that's why in a lot of photos, they are posed like that, squatting. Next, just kind of some film and TV things that the Bratva are mentioned in or featured in. So in the James Bond movies, Goldeneye and The World is Not Enough, the Bratva are kind of like the um, antagonists in those films. In Training Day, starring Denzel Washington, I haven't seen it, but I've heard of it. And I was like, that's probably one of the the more popular ones. It's from 2001, though. So I don't know if a lot of people would have seen it. We were but children. The next one. Never heard of it, but we have to watch it. It is called Lord of War, and it stars Nicolas Cage. I have actually seen that. Is it good? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I'll be watching it. (laughs) And apparently... It features the Bratva. Interestingly, in a lot of Batman films and TV shows, and also in other popular comics such as Hawkeye, Spider-Man, and The Punisher, the Bratva are Mm -hmm. the of the episode. I forgot The Punisher. Yeah. In the really shitty Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. (laughs) (laughs) No, it's bad. No, it's not bad. It's real bad. Um, Listen. It didn't I love anything. Indiana Jones. But it's like, that one was so bad. Yeah, it was oh, bad. He's old and it's corny. <laughs> it's really corny. Shia but- LaBeouf, baby! It, right. But the main adversaries in that film were uh, Bratva. In Orange is the New Black, Galena Red Reznikova was... Yes, a- queen. A- what was that word again? A Shestiorka, an associate of the Bratva. Um, and was in prison for it. Yeah. And in The Sopranos, there are a bunch of references to um, interacting with the Bratva. Uh, and then in what I've referred to as police propaganda shows like CSI, Miami, Criminal Minds, and Law and Order, and often every once in a while, there will be, you know, some Russian mobsters in there. And of I course, don't watch any of those. <laughs> I don't either. The third and final book of the Maid series by Daniel Laurie. The sweetest, no, the darkest, <laughs> the darkest temptation. The darkest, sweetest temptation. The darkest, sweetest temptation of obsession. Obsession. And oblivion features the Bratva. And, and also Sophie Lark's uh, series Brutal Air and The Kingmakers. <laughs> yes, which I need to read still. I love Sophie Lark, though. Um, I also think they briefly mention it in some of the Rocky films because Ivan oh, probably. Drog- Drago, Drogo is like from ussr and was like banned from russia oh yeah i'm sure i missed a lot i kind of was just putting some that i had heard of because i figure i figure if i've heard of them they tend to be more popular because to be honest i've not seen a lot of obscure films Um, lord of war is super good it has jared leto in it hey i was just excited about nick cage dude my man (laughs) I unironically love Nick Cage. Have, oh, let me look up the name of this one. Hold on. You know what? Yeah, no, he's a fucking solid actor. He is descended from the great Coppola's, so you can expect nothing but greatness from him. Really? Okay, Matchstick Men. Have you seen Matchstick Men? Mm-mm. It's really good. And Nick Cage has OCD in that film, so it all ties together. Huh. Yeah, Matchstick Men. It's good, and it has one of the best Nick Cage lines I've ever heard in my life. Yeah, in um, Lord of War, Nick Cage and Jared Leto are brothers, and, like, they are in the Bratva. Uh, I love Ethan that. Ethan Hawke is also in it. It's, like, a pretty star studded cast. I love Ethan Hawke. Same here. But, yeah, that basically wraps up our little information session about the Bratva. Did you learn some things? <laughs> I, I learned, learned so much. No, that's really cool. I think it's so interesting how, like, it's all organized crime, but, like, they all run so differently. Yeah, it's cool. It really is. 
join us next week as we wrap up the maid series with the darkest temptation super super excited to cover this one um i would say out of all of these books this is definitely the darkest it, it does is. not lie <laughs> but funnily enough it's also my favorite of the and films, yeah so. because we have something wrong with us um, <laughs> what does that say about us and then the week after that, we are going to be starting the Christmas season, actually. So Hell we're going to yeah. be writing our own Hallmark-style Christmas movies. Oh, yeah. I need to get started on that. <laughs> I do, too. I haven't even thought about it yet. <laughs> yeah. So we are going to be writing our own, um, basically, like, plots and, and characters for what we believe would be amazing Hallmark stories. So get reading on The Darkest Temptation. We'll see you then. And as always, let's get lit. Let's get lit.